Good morning and welcome to Market Cast 8 and a damp, dark, dreary November morning here in Bournemouth. But in the AF Oliver offices here, it's like an oasis of light, uh, hope and all things good. Um, a comment about the shirt first, obviously, just a quick one. It's a Christmas shirt and it's November, I hear you cry. Well, true on both counts. Um, the thing is, we won't be doing a Christmas or a festive market cast this year. The next market cast we are going to do is actually going to be on the 26th of January. Uh, I will be uh, emailing out a forecast at the end of the year, just so you can see how we adjust things as we come up to the year end. But in terms of a live, Market cast that's going to wait till Jan 26. And here's the thing uh, this is now market cast number eight. So we've been doing this since March of this year. And when we actually first conceived these, what we thought was it'd be a great thing to do for half an hour over a coffee and a bacon roll or a veggie roll before you start work at nine. I know a lot of you start work a lot before nine, but you know what I mean. So we timed it for 8 30 a.m. Now we're having a little think about next year, is 8.30 the right time? Would it be better to get in, get your coffee, your meetings out of the way and done with first, run it at nine? Um, I'd be very, very interested to hear your views. I'm sure you all know where I am on LinkedIn. Uh, either drop me an email at AF Oliver or uh, drop me a, a direct message on LinkedIn. And if you've got comments on times, we'd love to hear them. We're just having a little think about what we're gonna do this year. I also thought it would be a good idea, bearing in mind we're market cast eight and it's the last one of 2022, just to have a little look back and see how we're doing. I know I wear these silly shirts and it's become quite a thing now, but the stuff that we're talking about is really incredibly serious and it's actually gonna have an effect on people's, the way the market moves will have an effect on people's livelihoods and uh, it, it, it makes such a, huge uh, difference and has such a big impact on us right across the industry. I thought it was worth just having a little look at how we'd done so far. I popped back this morning. Uh, I picked this slide up here. Um, this came from Marketcast 2. Uh, so this was actually broadcast in April, in spring of this year. And let me take your mind back to April. Uh, okay, the, you know, the Ukrainian uh, conflict had, had started. Russia had marched into Ukraine already but the markets were still going crazy. Every line on every graph was pointing skywards. The world was a wonderful place, but we could already sense, couldn't we, the transition, that the market was in transition. And if you go back, all of these market casts, by the way, are all still there on YouTube. Um, and between them now, I had thousands of viewers, actually, I'm, I'm delighted to say. Um, but there and available to be seen. And you can see that we talked about uh, our volumes starting to retreat. I predicted back in April that we'd see 1.3 million transactions for the year. I'm delighted to see Alex, Richard Donnell and the team at Zoopla came out with their report yesterday uh, agreeing with me at 1.3 million. Um, and uh, I also said back in April, despite the, the track that we were on, that we were going to see inflation slow before the year end. And, and yes, we have seen that inflation slowing. I predicted back then that we'd end the year around 6% according to the Nationwide. Too early to say yet. Obviously, the Nationwide numbers aren't out for another couple of days yet for November. And then we've got December to get through too. So we'll, it will be interesting to see how those things uh, actually work out. I don't believe I'm going to be too far out. Uh, and then when you look uh, down here, I'm saying looking at those mortgage approvals and those other canary statistics that it was going to be late summer before we started to see the really obvious signs of this change and this transition uh, in, in market. I would like to think that if you were looking at that market cast back uh, seven or eight months ago, that that gave you a really good flavor of what we had in store for the year ahead and an accurate one too. So let's see if we can't keep that rolling and let's see if we can't actually put together how things are gonna happen. We can be fairly accurate now for quarter one of next year. You, you know, that, that die is cast, um, but what's really important for all of you looking at this uh, webcast, this market cast this morning, is where the rest of 2023 is going to work out. Let's go back a stage first then. 2022, my word. Who would have guessed it? If you wrote 2022 as a political sitcom, people would have said it's way too far-fetched. 
24th of February, our world changes, doesn't it? Russia's troops massed on the border of Ukraine invade everything. The, the energy prices explode, um, you know, the inflation takes off, confidence dives. Uh, it, it's a nightmare. And, and so at that point, you're thinking, how on earth do I describe the events that went next? So what I did was I tore a few pages out of my diary to share with you. Yes, not the good bits, not the juicy bits, but just the significant bits. So here we were. This was July. Do you remember Chris Pincher? Uh, he was the ex-Tory whip uh, and he got found guilty of doing some dreadful things or, or allegedly allegedly doing some dreadful things uh, and he had the Tory whip withdrawn. That was the 1st of July. Everything else was all, you know, com completely normal. Then, of course, Boris gets involved in defending him and did he know about it before? Didn't he know about it before? The next thing you know, uh, Rishi Sunak, Sajid Javid lead a huge wave of resignations. Half the cabinet resigns and, and, and obviously then Boris has a, to appoint a new chancellor. So here we go, look, on the 5th of July, we've got a new chancellor. Nadim Zahawi gets appointed chancellor and away we go. The next day, Kemi Brad Badnock and leads another huge raft of resignations. We're into 40 or 50 resignations now. The whole cabinet is leaving by the back door. Uh, and at this point, um, uh, Gove, Michael Gove, now of course at the uh, Department of Leveling Up, um, Michael Gove suggests advises Boris Johnson to resign. So what, 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 what else can Boris Johnson do? He fires Michael Gove, of course he does. Uh, and then of course, the following day on the 7th, Boris says, well, that's it, you know, I'll resign. Uh, and, and I think we all believe that he actually had a mind that he might be back some point later. What a week. <laughs> they say a week is a long time in politics. And then of course we get into August. And now there's the leadership uh, uh, contest is going on. We've got all the runners and riders and doing the hustings and all the rest of it. And in the meantime, the uh, crisis in Ukraine, driving uh, inflation, interest rates take their first hike up. And it's a big one, it's 0.5. It's the biggest rise for years and years and years. We go up from 1.25 to 1.75. Then. Here we go, 6th of September as we come into the autumn. It's so crazy, isn't it? We're only talking a couple of months ago. It's absolute madness. Liz Truss gets elected Tory leader. And of course, first thing she does is sack the chancellor because he was trying to uh, get the leadership ahead of hers uh, and, and appoint Kwasi Kwarteng. So he is our new chancellor, 6th of September. Two days later, God rest her soul, Her Majesty the Queen passes away uh, and now we go into a two week uh, period of mourning, which gives everyone a chance just to take a deep breath. On the 21st of September, the Bank of in in England come back in for another chunk, another 50 basis points. And we see interest rates go up from 1.75 to 2.25. You don't need me to tell you what happened on the 23rd of December, yes, it was quasi down the quasi. Uh, he actually presents his mini budget and there it was, a 45% tax rate went, the banker's cap on bonuses went, uh, the corporation plan, corporation tax rise, that went. Um, there was a, uh, uh, the whole thing, you, you know it all, you don't need me to go through that. And as a result, the gilts collapse, the markets go crazy. The pound falls to a record low, uh, $1.09. It might, it might even have gone lower than that at one point. Mortgage products are swept off the table. Suddenly there's 1,800 mortgage products are gone. They're just not available there anymore. As all the institutions panic, well done institutions, thank you for that. And they race back to their boardrooms and they hike their uh, interest rates sky high. We all take a deep breath. We come into October, we realise that can't go on. Uh, Quasi hung on until the 14th of October uh, and Liz then appoints Jeremy Hunt. He gets appointed as the new chancellor, yet another chancellor, chancellor number four in as many minutes. Uh, and he, the first thing he does on being appointed is to tell uh, the, 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 the country and the world uh, that he is going to unpick everything, or pretty much everything, everything that he can that was in the mini budget. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, 
gilts recover, uh, mortgage rates start to settle down and actually even tickle down a little bit. Uh, certainly the swap rates uh, tickle down a bit. Uh, and then on the 20th, the pressure gets so great that Liz Trust resigns and having uh, gone through all of the hiatus that we had when Boris resigned earlier in the year, Rishi is appointed just four days later on the 24th. Uh, here we are, we're in November now, and, and we've sort of brought you right smack bang up to date. Um, Bank of England come back in for another go, but this time it's 0.75, biggest rise ever, and that takes us from 2.25 to 3%. It looks to all the world as though the days of low interest rates are over, certainly over for the foreseeable future. When I say low, I think they're probably still low, but ultra low are gone. And then on the 17th, uh, Jeremy Hunt, who I believe postponed his autumn statement from the 20 odd of the, of the month before because he wanted to see our market cast first. Um, uh, he then unpicks everything that was in the mini budget as he promised he would. And the only escapees from all that were the national insurance, the planned rise is, 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 is abolished. Uh, and the stamp duty uh, cuts or the, or the increase in stamp duty allowances are kept, albeit stamp duty now only temporarily, as I'm sure you know, everything else goes. Taxes go up, spending goes down, um, the markets calm down, gilts recover, the pound rallies, the mortgage swap rates come down, and we are now suddenly, it might be a bit more of a painful place, but it is most certainly a calmer place. What's gonna happen? I do not see a crash. I am irritated constantly by reading newspaper headlines that talk about 30% falls in value and crashes. It's not going to happen. Uh, and I know it's a dangerous thing to say when you're actually broadcasting a live market cast, but from everything I can see, I do not believe it's going to happen. Why? Why? But first of all, it's in very few people's interest for it to happen, uh, not just in the UK, but, but the world over, certainly the Western, econ Western economies, that's for sure. Interest rates have already stabilised. There is a, a feeling of sense that's actually prevailing now. Uh, you know, the, 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 the next draft of interest rates are certainly as mortgage rates, and I'm not talking about base rates now, I shouldn't confuse the two, are actually, we're looking at down rather than up. I don't know whether you, pick, you guys picked this up in the Telegraph this week, where tracker rates now, you can, you can get these tracker rates now at 3%. I'm not advising anybody to go out and buy a tracker. I still think a fixed rate mortgage is by far and away the safest uh, and best way to plan ahead. But these tracker rates now, you can actually get tracker rates up at less than 3% in some instances. It's quite extraordinary. And even the fixed rate money is coming down. And it certainly wouldn't surprise me to see fixed rate money uh, at between 4 and 4.5% 4 and by the time we get to the end of the year, actually. There is still a demand and supply imbalance. It's changing. It is definitely changing. But right now, it is still there. The employment market is still very, very strong. There's 1.2 million vacancies in the UK, and that is 50% higher than it was pre-COVID to 2019. So that's really important too. The, the stamp duty changes that Jeremy Hunt wasn't in time to stop will make a big difference. Obviously, help to buy has gone now. Uh, and uh, you know that's been with us all the way since 2013. Uh, and we don't, still don't really know, do we, exactly what a difference that's going to make in the first time buyer market, particularly those, that stamp duty, those stamp duty changes and the raising of the threshold, uh, particularly next year, the first year without help to buy, will definitely make a difference. And financially as a country, we are better stress tested, way better stress tested than we were in 08, 09, when you could go out and get a mortgage for 110% of the value of the property you want to buy. How crazy does that sound today? And of course, most mortgages stress tested up to 7%. The institutions have had to have much stronger balance sheets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I am convinced there will not be a crash. I'm absolutely convinced, and I, but I deliberately put this in capital letters. And then when I looked at the presentation again this morning, I highlighted it in yellow because there will be an adjustment. There is no question there will be an adjustment and asking prices in particular will come under pressure. And I want to talk a bit about asking prices today. 
But where the negative press stories are, you know, oh, they're out there, aren't they? You know, the Daily Mails and Daily Expresses and, and they're all and the broad, they're all they're all in there together with this. It's not just the mainstream media. You know, I pick up property industry eye here, you know, and a, a property uh, values might dive into negative territory. And then a picture of the UK with a red arrow sending us all to Hades. You know, this is we've really got to I wish the media would just take a more sensible better balanced view of all this <coughs> excuse me and um, it really is very very frustrating uh, fears for uk property market collapse the word collapse is in there uh, and, and in the same sentence crash it's collapse it's not just a collapse it's a collapse and a crash my word uh, and here we go this is the mail online house prices could drop could drop by as much as 30 percent they might actually go up by 5%, but they could drop by as much as 30%. And this actually isn't helping. Um, it was a great timing of this uh, market cast today because the boys at Zoopla released their, uh, their report. I love the Zoopla report and they released it yesterday. Uh, they brought it forward so as I could actually have a read of it before the market cast. Thank you, Richard. Um, and uh, it was really interesting. One of the, they put a lot of good stats in there we'll touch on. One of them was, was uh, about the number of uh, listed properties that have had their asking prices reduced. But even in that great Zoopla report, there's no mention of the fact that every year the asking prices, the, a percentage of properties get their asking pr prices reduced as we move from autumn into the winter market. That transition from October into November, it's a typical and a regular thing. I think Rightmove talked about 8% of their listings having prices uh, reduced. Pre-COVID, that was 7.5%. So, you know, so there's no difference there. We just need to be really careful. Um, there's also talk about the number of sales fall-throughs increasing. You see, I, I take a slightly different view to most people on this. I think those fall-throughs are not so much about uh, buyers hitting problems with mortgages or affordability. I think it's much more about buyers being a bit blooming savvy. They're thinking, hang on a minute, if this market is moving backwards, if asking prices are coming down slightly, why wouldn't I actually just walk away from that and maybe do a slightly different and better deal? Uh, that's just my take on that. But please just beware these. What's important for any developers watching this and sales teams watching this, just make sure your frontline sales teams are aware of some of the nonsense that gets spouted in those press stories. What's really going on? What's really going on? I very deliberately put a kite in on this slide because the thing about asking prices, can I ask you all honestly, as an audience, if you were selling your house tomorrow, would you, be honest, would you put your house on the market for exactly the price that you wanted to sell it? Now I'm guessing 98% of you are saying no. I'll leave myself a little bit of room. I'm gonna put it on the market at 300,000 because what I really wanna get for that is 285K. You do, don't you? You leave yourself a bit of room. And when the market gets great, what you do is you fly a kite. You, could, uh, you, you increase those asking prices because you've seen uh, Doris across the road there, a uh, crikey, she got 312,000. Let's pour ours on for 325. No, I'm done, let's fly the kite. And that's what happens then, asking prices go flying away. Now, when you get a market transition, asking prices are the first things to get affected. You have to reel that kite back in. Of course you do, because you're then coming back down to slightly more realistic levels. So that's a really important difference. And asking prices always take a dip at this time of the year. Go check out the, the right move data. You'll, you'll see that. And I think I actually put in here the right move are showing 8% have reduced uh, their prices this month. It was 4% this time last year. 2021, crazy year, 2019, and you'll hear a lot of stats these days talking about 2014 to 2019, because they were the normal years before we hit COVID, it was 7.5%. So from that point of view, yeah, um, demand, demand, uh, you know, right move was saying demand is down 20%. It's still up on the pre-COVID numbers. You know, we've got to get a sense of perspective about this uh, and look out for the kite flying. Where are we going next? My classic matrix, that's the one I think you saw last month. We still had low supply and high demand pushing up here. These were the, the, the developer incentives. Need to keep an eye on my time. Um, 
this is where we've gone now. That low supply, high demand is now moving backwards. We have more properties coming onto the market uh, and, and demand obviously, as you've just seen from that last slide there is slightly reducing. And now this is where the developers have to come to the fore and recognize that maybe their asking prices need a bit of a look. And we're starting to see this now, aren't we? With discounts, with financial products, and of course, the classic there, part exchange. And down here in the negative areas, low affordability, low consumer confidence, uh, and rising mortgage rates are still there, but just back a little bit from there. So, so, so that matrix is, is telling me that it's gonna be a tricky market, but it's gonna be a slightly more stable market. You all know this is, this, you all know I love this chart, but it's a really interesting chart this month. So these are brand new numbers from GFK, from their consumer confidence barometer. Have a look at this, everybody. So, so for those of you that don't know, here's the zero line. Ask 2,000 people what they think is going to happen over the next 12 months. If they answer getting better, they're, they're, they'll come out above the line. If, they if the majority answer is getting worse, it will be below the line. And this is what's been going on all through 2022, right down to record lows here at the end of September 2022. Record lows in the 50 years or so that this uh, survey has been being carried out. And then it took a surprising little uptick last month and another uptick again. And it's because I think we've got to the base of our, we've, we've what, what is it they say in, in, in uh, stock market terms? We've priced it in, we've priced the bad news in, the public have priced the bad news in. I love this little comment over here. This is uh, Joe Statton, the uh, strategy director, strat director from uh, GFK, who says, this month's Philip is likely to reflect uh, nothing more than a collective sigh of relief. It's got this bad, we've priced it in. We're actually, we're stabilizing, we're stabilizing. A quick trot through some of the indices before we get to the crucial bit uh, at the close. Um, you can see their asking prices uh, uh, for November, right move, 1.1% down, brings us to 7.2% for the year, pretty much where we would have expected to be, isn't it, around this time of year? Do you remember I showed you this chart last month, showing you how March, April was the transition point, and these are offers accepted below asking price in grey, showing you beautifully there where that transition point was in April. Look, another couple of pendulum slides here. This is the average asking price trend from Rightmove. You can see really clearly where that, there, where that transition point was. We were, don't forget, we were telling you this last April. So this is, not a, this is nothing new. So we knew this. Those little arrows have been there for months. Um, and this, a great chart uh, out of uh, Zoopla's report yesterday. <coughs> These are the proportion of people uh, who, who took a cut in asking price. So look, have a little look at this. This is uh, the sort of mid-2021 uh, mid here. And suddenly more and more and more people are getting full asking price. And here's the 100% here all the way along there. And look at this, June time-ish, 2022. It was even a little blip above 100%. And then we started to come off the other side. And this is where we're heading now as reality dawns. Those kites were flown a bit too high, weren't they? So those kites have had to be pulled in. Take a look at the right move indices online. I haven't got time to go through them this morning. I wanna talk much more importantly about where the market is actually going next. Interesting though to see that in their national uh, map, their regional trends, uh, the rate of decrease across all those regional trends is lower than it was back in August. Again, for me, no surprise there. You know, that's exactly what I expect. That's the only slide in on Nationwide because the new numbers are due out in a couple of days' time, so there was little point in putting those in. These are October numbers, uh, and, and we're waiting for the November numbers, obviously. These are brand new from Zoopla. Uh, look at this over there with their unique mix of asking prices, um, mortgage approval uh, prices, and sold prices. 7.8% uh, price growth for the year. Uh, no surprise there for me whatsoever. Volumes down 28% against a year ago, of course they are, but they are still above where we were uh, 2014 to 2019. Um, and then, so this is a, an asking price reduction, one in four, and no shock for me there. And, and I'm amazed some of the irresponsible uh, reporting in the newspapers on those stats. 
Great comment here from uh, Richard Donnell. Uh, we still expect house price pools of, of, of up to 5% next year. Uh, a million sales, mortgage rates dipping below 5%. Um, that's close to where I am with this. Um, uh, but the number of sales going through will remain buoyant. And, and because of structural uh, factors inside the market, uh, here's the city's index. Aberdeen still down there at 0.1%. Don't forget the variations between the regions are absolutely enormous. They're 12, 13% variations. Another great chart from Zoopla, which shows the shift. And I've been following this all year and it shows the shift between demand and supply. And you can see that it's easing. So demand is back by 47% there and then stock of homes for sale is up by 40%. It's equalizing beautifully, isn't it? That demand supply imbalance is getting better and better and better. And this is the repricing that Zoopla talk about. Uh, this is the big repricing at the top there, the dark ones, 10% uh, or more. And in here you can see five to 10% and then they're up to 5%. Nothing in there that bothers me whatsoever. And this comes up to a total of around 25%, exactly what I would expect at this time of the year. Uh, mortgage approvals dip down for the month. I think the number there is 67,000. That still means 100,000 completions in a monthly period. So, you know, those, that, those quantities are still staying up there. I'm sticking with 1.3 million for the year, as I have done literally since last December. Uh, and uh, interest rates, mortgage rates, well, you can see where that trend was. Bit unfortunate I haven't got the new numbers for you because we would see those turn over and take a little dip at the month end. Uh, so, I, you know, uh, uh, do get in touch with me personally and I'll, sh I'll send you an updated one when we've got those new numbers in there. Inflation, we all know now, CPI stands at 11.1%. CPIH is just under 10%. But I think, I'm no economist as I've said before, but I think we are at peak inflation and I think we're coming down the other side. It looks to me as though energy prices are stabilizing as are lots of other costs too. And I think mortgage rates are also looking to come down. I think, I really do think that's peak inflation. It's another reason why I think this market is stabilizing. These are the volumes and you can see how they've evened out. They're gonna come back to 100,000 a year or just under, aren't they probably? I'm not gonna bore you with those charts. I just wanted to show you the comparison between where we are now uh, that's year-to-date numbers. Okay, this was crazy last year. But we all know that the, uh, the volumes were crazy last year. This is this year's volumes. Here's the, the, the you know, normality years, 14 to 19. Look, look, we're ahead of where we were. And this is the October. This is for the month. Here's this year. Here's normality years here. We're doing okay. Stop, stop panicking, everybody. And talking of people panicking, have a quick look at the RICS October survey. That's level. That's getting better, that's getting worse. I'm not saying anything there. These are newly agreed sales. So I think you can see there where we're going. Lot of seasonality in there. These are new instructions. Well, apart from, I think that's Wales in there. I'm pretty sure it is. I think that were people selling their houses so they could afford to go to Qatar to watch them in the World Cup. Not certain. Um, sorry, Mr. Lewis. Uh, so uh, you can see here, here's zero. And you can see where we were on new instructions. And this is new buyer inquiries. Oh dear, oh dear. Lock any windows above the first floor level in all RICS members offices, please. Uh, and in terms of prices, this is pretty much the south and southeast here. Uh, and even in all of those other regions, the floating diamonds show you that the trend is downwards. No shocks, no surprises. These are where they believe volumes are going in three and 12 months. Again, no surprises there. And you can see every single region in the UK, RICS members in that according to their uh, October survey believes they feel volumes are gonna fall and they feel the same way with prices. So these are prices over th three and 12 months. And these are the regions with prices. And even our dear uh, optimistic friend in Northern Ireland, who was always the only one left there above the line, has actually now come south of the line and left his diamond uh, floating all on its own. Um, Agent stock climbed all the way up here, took a tick back last month, which I've got to say did surprise me. I predicted that that was going to be 51. Um, but I think that might just be the general, that general autumn uh, downturn. So where do prices go next? This is where we are so far on Nationwide. We'll get the November numbers tomorrow. 
Uh, I'm, or the day after tomorrow, I think, uh, I'm predicting they will be around here. If they're around there, these are average prices. If they are around there, we will see average prices go here and end the year probably about 27, 272. Uh, so, but, but crucially, what's gonna happen next? Well, this is where I believe uh, we go next. So if you actually look, if this is January 2023, and I think by then we will actually see growth falling to around 4%, and then I think, you can, uh, I, I think you can actually see then where we go through February, March, April, and May. And we're still in positive growth all the way down here. Uh, and I personally think that we are gonna see an uptick in March. Now that's a, some people might say crazy, some people might say brave. I personally think that we will see an uptick in March. There are some caveats there on interest rates and other things and crazy things not happening but just watch out for that. And if that does that, this is where average prices are gonna go. So we'll be on this falling market here, March will come around, and I think we're gonna see an uptick. And then I think we will come back down into this pattern, falling into negative around the halfway, midway point of the year. I think we'll see another slowing down of the reduction as we go in from late summer into early autumn. And then we'll see that reduction then coming down into the winter months. I think we are going to end next year at minus 4%. And I know that is probably one of the most optimistic of people that are actually offering you their forecasts. That is where I believe we're going to be. And if that is the case, we will end up with a UK average price between 255 and 260. And don't forget, they're based on nationwide numbers. So that's a big judgment call. I have looked at that chart and those numbers over and over and over, uh, over the last five days and agonize over where I thought, thought they were gonna be. Don't forget, it doesn't matter how many economists you stick in an office, they're all still guessing because nobody knows what's gonna happen to Ukraine and nobody knows the effect that will have on world markets. So we all have to make some assumptions, whoever you are. I've based this on how I feel the market feels out there right now. This is really important for the developers probably more important than the last slide. These are the very latest numbers I could get. I took these off the land registry at 1 a.m. this morning, uh, and uh, the current average value uh, of new home up to the end of July, that's the latest numbers land registry have got, was 383K, uh, and if the existing properties at 285K. That means the premium between the average price new, average price existing, is 45% currently. Now, I might not know many things, but let me tell you, as this market goes through transition and we move into a market moving backwards, that gap will close. I'm telling you it will, and I, I will stake my reputation on it. This was 2008, 2009 here, when it dropped to 13%. The average through between those two lines is 23%. It doesn't matter what the numbers are, it's how the lines actually uh, 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 relate to each other. There has been another significant change as we came through COVID that's affected those numbers, and that is the mix. So builders have been building more detached, more terraced. They've been building fewer apartments as the public have looked for different things than the lifestyle changes. And that has clearly added to the average cost of new against uh, existing. So, so there are other factors in there too, but believe you me that the market drives this enormously and that gap will close. And that means if you set forecasts that you actually put together in May or June, July of this year, you're gonna have to adjust those forecasts. You just are, because that is gonna change. So I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> I can almost hear my phone ringing now on my desk. So in summary, then uh, I'm running over. In summary, uh, unless there is something cataclysmic that happens that, that cannot be foreseen, the market won't crash, it just won't crash. Those regional variations are gonna be huge and they, you have to take those into account. It's gonna be massive. New homes average values over the next six months are going to fall much more quickly than secondhand. Uh, and unless we stay on that curve, new home sales rates will fall faster than existing property sales rates. 
In fact, I know that's already happening. So, uh, so that's something that we really do need as an industry to bear in mind. So pending then the December, uh, my December review, I think that 2023 is going to end up next year at about minus 4%. That's my view. I believe that the transactions for 2023 are going to end up just over the million mark, about 1.1 million. Uh, and, and, and again, I agonized over that one too, believe you me. Uh, I think that the new home share, and when I say the new home share, I'm not including uh, affordable Section 106 property. I'm talking about uh, spec uh, open market sales. I think the new home share is going to fall back to about 12 and a half percent. That's 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 my that's my take on that. Thoughts on strategy. Last slide. Um, uh, watch out for these variations in local markets. They're massive. Uh, they can on one hand, they can actually lead you into having roofed unsold stock. On the other hand, on the flip of that, uh, giving away potential margin that's still out there to be had. So you've got to fine tune pricing to local markets. You all know that anyway. That canary data is out there. You can actually get those local trends sorted out, plot the price curve down. Literally for each single site, it will pay and it, it's worth it. Um, and uh, this is so important. Uh, get yourself a great uh, independent financial advisor. There are so many good ones out there that I know and work with and love who are creative and who will devise schemes that will actually take us through the help to buy pain. You know, I'm reading just this morning that there, you know, uh, that there are products out there right now where uh, FTBs, first time buyers can actually get 95% loan, uh, loan to value mortgages. Uh, and don't forget, even those fixed rates are starting to settle. Uh, and for me, direct marketing, under the cover marketing techniques at a time when prices are coming down is a great way to do it. You probably know that too. Okay, there we go. Uh, that's a six minute over on, I think. That's my worst in, in eight minute, eight market casts, um, but it is the last one of the year. Um, I really do hope that I get to see you all on the 26th of January. I have so enjoyed doing these next year. I'll think about whether we carry on with the silly shirts next year. Uh, I guess it will depend how the market's doing after Christmas. In the meantime, for those of you that are still with me, thank you so much. Have a great Christmas. Big thanks to Hannah to Joan and James, um, the, the team that have actually helped put these together through this year. They've been absolutely wonderful. Uh, and I'll see you in 2023. Have a great Christmas.